2010, a seemingly innocent dinner date sets off a series of events which ultimately leads to a lengthy trial and a prison sentence. This was a great story. It had everything. You have an A-list actor, you have a beautiful stalker, and you have a lot of lies. But this is no ordinary couple. One of them is the actor Alec Baldwin. The other is a woman whom he accuses of stalking him. You think you know me, but you don't. You think I'm Alec Baldwin's stalker. I'm not. What emerges in evidence is a picture of an obsessed person, someone on a mission to become part of the A-list actor's life. I'm in full ovulation, you know, now's the time to go. I want to have your baby. She proposed to him at one point, told him she wanted to have a mini Baldwin with him. And that's when Alec got very, very frightened. This is the story of Alec Baldwin's stalker, how she met him and became determined to become a part of his life. Alec realized, oh my God, she is there for real. She's genuine. She's speaking the truth. She loves me for real. And how her obsessive behavior became relentless and all-consuming. She causes him a great deal of consternation, and she absolutely terrifies his partner. And then she was convicted and told, told to stay away, and she still came back to, to, to his, his apartment. I don't know where she is now, but I, I hope she's nowhere near him. This is an extraordinary story a story of how fame can backfire and how fan worship can become obsession. By 2011, the actor Alec Baldwin was involved in a full-blown stalker situation with a woman who believed he wanted her to be his wife. I am not Alec Baldwin's stalker and I'm gonna prove it to you. Let's start this journey uh, of exposing the truth with Alec Baldwin and Ilaria Baldwin and many, many others. But how had someone like Baldwin allowed something like this to happen to him? Alec Baldwin is part of an acting dynasty and a hugely popular star in America, not only in film, but also in television. He is somebody who I think has reached mega stardom levels. Alec Baldwin grew up in Massapequa, New York. Um, he is the second of six brothers, and a lot of his brothers, of course, have gone on to have famous acting careers just like he did. But acting wasn't the path he'd originally taken as a young man. He was just like a regular kid in high school, very popular, he played football. Um, he didn't, you know, it didn't seem at the time that he was interested in acting. He actually went to George Washington University and actually studied political science, but decided instead of becoming a lawyer, he wanted to become an actor, so he studied at NYU. Baldwin soon showed his natural talent for performing, and it wasn't long before his career took off. He got his big break on a soap opera called The Doctors, and he spent a lot of time in TV before jumping over to film. But it wasn't until 1986 when he got his big break in Beetlejuice alongside Gina Davis and Michael Keaton. From there, his career just kind of took off. He bounced back and forth between TV and movies and showed that he had a wide range. He could do both comedy and drama, starring in The Aviator to Along Came Polly. And of course, he had his big break with 30 Rock, starring alongside Tina Fey in the NBC hit comedy. Hollywood is full of celebrity couples, and Baldwin soon became involved with someone whose career was well established. Alec Baldwin and Kim Bassinger were married together for several years. Um, you know, this was another coupling of two A-list stars. She is beautiful. LA Confidential, she was one of the stars of that. And, you know, they made quite the intense couple. Baldwin was no stranger to controversy, though, and would often let his aggressive side come to the fore. Alec Baldwin's quite intense. He's very serious. Um, he's intense in his acting and also in his personal life. Alec Baldwin is certainly very hot-headed. He seems to have a lot of difficulty controlling his emotions and has some anger issues. In 2011, a stewardess asked him to power off his phone, and he refused and threw a massive tantrum. He had to be escorted off the flight. He speaks his mind. Yeah, he, he doesn't hold back. I mean, he's been doing that all along. I mean, he's still doing that. He hasn't let up. 
Just recently, Alec Baldwin made news again because he got into a fight with a guy in New York City over a parking spot. Baldwin has a way of, of, of escalating situations that most of us try to de-escalate. It almost seems as though he thinks there's a different set of rules that applies to him, given his celebrity. He's had spats with, sadly, with his children that have been documented. I mean, left her a message on a phone machine that's been widely replayed around the world. I am going to get on a plane, and I'm going to come out there for the day, and I'm going to straighten your ass out when I see you. Do you understand me? I'm going to really make sure you get it. But conversely, he also has a protective side when it comes to his family. He definitely has a protective side, as we saw back in 1993 with Kim Basinger. Just days after she gave birth, they were walking with their child, and a photographer tried to come up and approach them and take their picture, and he was not having that at all. He's a feisty fella. He's well known for punching the occasional photographer. That doesn't mean that he invites drama into his life, or he enjoys it if it does intrude upon him. In the early part of the century, that's exactly what happened when Genevieve Sabaran crossed his path. In 2002, Sabarin met Baldwin on the set of The Adventures of Pluto Nash. It was a film that he had a small cameo in, but she was acting as publicist. She's beautiful, energetic, erratic, and a little unstable. Although they didn't have many dealings with each other at that stage, Sabaran claimed that Baldwin had tried to get to know her better. She claimed that when he was still married, he had tried to slip her his phone number under the table, and she didn't call him because he was still married. And then t 10 years later, a mutual friend arranged a meeting. By 2010, Sabaran had made a move to New York to focus on her acting career. Baldwin was now living in Manhattan, following his fraught and very public divorce from Kim Basinger. They met here in New York while she was contemplating this change of life and effort to make a career of acting. On at least one occasion, I think there is no dispute that they had dinner together. The stories may begin to diverge at that point. They met for dinner on behalf of a mutual friend, Martin Bergman. Now, he claims that jean Viev wanted some career advice and wanted to get that from Alec, so Alec met up with her. I think it was a combination of a perspective romance and a opportunity to advance her career instantly. There are two entirely differing versions of their night together in Manhattan. She claims that that night ended in a sexual encounter, which Alec denied. It's slightly murky. Um, it depends if it's, well, whether you believe her or you believe him. According to Sabaran, Baldwin was trying to clean up his image after the messy divorce and the public relations disaster of the phone call with his daughter. She, she claimed, was central to that plan. Alec couldn't, couldn't take the risk, couldn't afford to try again. He couldn't afford to be hurt again. And he couldn't afford, his career could not afford to present somebody that he loves, present somebody that he is engaged, present somebody that he wants to marry, marry her, perhaps have children with her, and then a year after, everything collapsed, it's another divorce, and it would be the end of Alec Baldwin's career, as the other situation with Kim Messinger and Ireland Baldwin would have linked with another failure. And the press, they're so mean, they would have jumped on that and killed his career. Baldwin, says Genevieve, needed someone to front for him as a perfect woman in his life. Alec is smart, he knows the business, and he wants to succeed. He thought I was vulnerable with needs that he would fulfill in exchange for me to be the image of what he needed, which is always on red carpet. My husband is adorable, I love him, we're so happy, and we do this, and our children is doing this. Everything is wonderful, he's so great, he's such a great lover, we have good sex, he's fantastic with kids, he's fantastic at home, he's this, he's that. I was pretty, I was young, I was thin, I was fit, I was 
I was different. I had this signature accent that is sexy. Uh, Alec joked about it. He liked that very much. You know, I had a good packaging that was interesting for, for, for his project and the offer he wanted to give me. Alec, she claimed, needed a mail-order bride to clean up his act. But Genevieve didn't want to be a temporary solution. I never thought I was uh, on a casting evening for a mail order bride with fake appearances that we are a happy married couple. I just wanted to be an happy married couple, so it's very different. Then, according to Genevieve, the relationship became very personal. Alec realized, oh my God, she is there for real. She's genuine. She's speaking the truth. She loves me for real. She cares. She is moving in with me for real. She is wanting children with me for real. He touched my hands. He became protective. He became even more engaged. Like if I was somebody that he cared for, a precious flower or precious diamond, and he understood that I was not the right candidate to be mail order bride. The evening progressed. I don't think it was much of a business meeting. He helped arrange a room for her at a very nice hotel called the Lao, and they uh, went for a lovely stroll in Central Park. They went to a Broadway show, and then went back to her hotel room and continued their evening. It, it reached a level of love and romance that was rare. I said, commitment, you know? <laughs> I was like, my God, he's, 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 he's doing things fast, but some people are like that, so I did not know. He kisses me in a way that I've rarely been kissed like that. It was full of love and care and passion and tenderness. From that on, we made love and it was fabulous and he trembled in his voice and he had tears and he said, I don't want to hurt you. Ding, 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 red flag. <laughs> the only aspect of the evening that both parties agree on is that they had dinner. From Mr. Baldwin's perspective, he was doing a favor to Marty Bregman. He had dinner, it ended there. They both went their separate ways. She became obsessed. From Miss Savarine's perspective, they had dinner, they had this romantic evening in the park, then back at the hotel, they had sex. He had said things to her throughout the evening that made her believe that this was the start of a longer relationship, uh, something more in depth. Regardless of what occurred that night, the events of the evening had a profound effect on Genevieve Sabaran. The dinner that Sabaran had with Alec Baldwin was clearly a big event for her. And why wouldn't it be, you know, she's having dinner here with a big movie star. But it's something that she's clearly ruminated on and she's been thinking about a lot. And she has decided that that was love. That was something epic and life-changing for her. And she believes for him also. According to her, they had phone sex several times. He expressed an interest in continuing a relationship with her. They spoke on the phone, they emailed, and he reciprocated a lot of this initially. I think she believed that they were gonna have a romance going forward and that this was the start of a new life for her. And unfortunately, that was not the case. But Alec Baldwin had another woman on his mind. The media soon began to report that he was in a new relationship. He started seriously courting Hilaria, who would become his future wife and, and the mother of four of his children. Born in Spain, Hilaria was working as a yoga instructor in New York when Alec Baldwin met her. While Baldwin appeared to be committed to Hilaria, Sabaran claims that he was in constant contact with her. Sometimes he would call me at midnight and I would see the next morning on internet that he was at the Emmy Award with her. So he, w he started going out with Ilaria on his public deal appearances, but when he came back alone at home, he would call me for an hour. That tells a lot. 
either she um, perceived something that happened that didn't, or maybe there was something that happened, you know, that he expected to be short term and she just continued. And at that point, he was now married to a, a woman. I think he started backing away. And I think that she continued to come on stronger and stronger and stronger. Genevieve now embarked on a mission to get Baldwin's attention. Sabarain starts to bombard him with email messages, which are bizarre, really, in content. The emails that I was shown as part of discovery in the criminal case are dated 2012. They occurred after there had been public acknowledgement that Alec Baldwin was involved in a relationship which culminated in the marriage with Hilaria. And they all contain reference to the fact that my client wanted to have a meeting with Alec Baldwin, that she wanted what she at various points referred to as closure with regard to their relationship. There are some that indicated that she was deeply in love with Alec Baldwin, that she wanted to marry him that she wanted to be a part of his life. She was not gonna let this just die down, that she was gonna go and confront him, and she's an outspoken, vocal woman. She wanted her feelings to be out there, and she wanted to be heard. And once it became apparent that he had no interest in her other than a one-night stand, I think she reacted, and I think she overreacted. And I think that was the impetus to the uh, avalanche of emails Mr. Baldwin received. Some were friendly and some were saying, I need money from you or I want to have your baby. She proposed to him at one point, told him she wanted to have a mini Baldwin with him. They moved from, I mean, full ovulation, you know, now's the time to go, to call the FBI if you want me out of your life, otherwise I'm going to hound you. As time went on, Genevieve appears to have become more desperate for communication. The amount of emails increased, and their tone began to change. As a general proposition, the behavior that is often attributed to those that are ultimately charged with stalking and harassment, if their initial emails aren't answered, or they don't get the answer they want, the conduct can escalate. The tone of the emails can become more strident, they can become more frequent, they can become more manic, and the conduct can escalate just as a general proposition. Sabaran began to turn her attention towards Hilaria Baldwin. It's extremely common for family members to be embroiled in this web that is spun by a stalker, because a stalker is interested in anybody that has any form of connection to their target. She looks at his partner and thinks, well, if you weren't in the picture, would that clear the way for me? And that obviously puts his partner in a very precarious situation because she becomes a target for all of that anger, that vitriol, that resentment. She was craving attention. She was craving fame. She was craving to have uh, expensive dress and hair and talk on the interview so you could see like in 2012 when he takes her on on red carpet she put herself in between the interviewer and Alec Baldwin just to speak a comment because she wants to be known she wants the attention she wants to have she wants to she's using him for fame I think she wanted a response I think she wanted the interaction it's not the first case where I've seen this, where someone becomes incessant and wants a reaction from the other individual. And they hope that this is going to obtain it for them. They hope that somehow that their conduct's going to alleviate those feelings that they have inside. It's not the appropriate course of action, but what can we say? People who are heartbroken do unfortunate things. By the end of March, 2012, the situation began to escalate from emails and messages to something more sinister for Alec and Hilaria. She started showing up at, at his home. And that's when Alec got very, very frightened. 
I mean, never Al Pacino or Steven Tyler or Denzel Washington uh, or Harvey Weinstein, for, for that matter, gave me their addresses. Never they wrote, uh, you're most welcome to come visit me at any given time, you're welcome. They never said that. Alec Baldwin did. She lost reality. She came out of touch with reality. And, and th that was the, the clue that something was not, not good here. She causes him a great deal of consternation and she absolutely terrifies his partner because she'd been showing up at her place of work. And so what she'd done is she'd changed all of her routine and her classes. And that's what victims of stalking do. They change their life and they must feel under siege. They do everything that they can not to come into contact with or attract a stalker's attention. But of course, if you've got somebody who's utterly determined to find you, to track you down and confront you, then that's likely to happen. In March 2012, Sabarine was attempting to make contact with Alec Baldwin actually at his home in the Hamptons. So she showed up, he claims the day that he proposed to Hilaria and, uh, and was panicked, he called the police, he said he feared that she may have had a weapon. And then she shows up in April at an event that he was attending at the Lincoln Center. So she's starting to take more and more decisive action to be in the place that he is in. And I think she's thinking that, well, my emails haven't resulted in the relationship that I want, but he just needs to see me. And if I present myself to him, if he sees me, then he'll feel this connection that we've got. The conduct had, in the view of law enforcement, escalated from sending emails to showing up where Alec Baldwin was in performance, that the content of the emails may have been directed not solely at her relationship with Mr. Baldwin, but at Mr. Baldwin's choice of a fiance. It may have crossed certain lines in the eyes of Mr. Baldwin and or uh, law enforcement that led to her arrest. On April 8, 2012, after months of stalking Alec Baldwin, Genevieve Sabaran finally crossed the line. She turned up at his home, and I think the doorman, you know, contacted Hilaria to be like, there's somebody here to see you. And she was like, wait, that's the person that's been stalking Alec Baldwin. You know, don't let her in. And this woman reportedly told the doorman or said at the time that Hilaria is a bitch and a prostitute. Police arrived at the scene and arrested Genevieve. She was charged with aggravated harassment and stalking despite her protestations that she was simply dropping in to say hello. I was in town, so I said, let's go have a coffee because you're still calling me, you're still texting me, and obviously I think you're dating somebody else, so perhaps it's a good time to sit down and clear everything and put everything in order. Or unless I'm totally wrong with what I see in the news and perhaps you're not with her, and then I'm moving in. Like the doorman called upstairs and I thought he was calling Alec. So I said, give me the phone, give me the phone. Like, like technically what's going on in here? And I could never get the phone because obviously now I know Alec was not there, was not on site, it was Ilaria. So it was Ilaria that did all this. I mean, how could a little blonde girl that he knows for 15 years uh, cause him fear, you know, because she wants to go for a coffee with him because he calls me and write me all the time. But Genevieve's name was now up in lights. Even when people take out restraining orders on stalkers, they feel like that's some sort of accomplishment because they've gotten noticed. They've gotten that recognition and they've gotten that validation that this person knows who I am. I'm now a part of their lives forever. April 9th to the 12th, Sabarine was hiding out from the press. She'd already spent 27 hours in prison, but she was part of a media storm. Wow. She's part of a media story that involves Alec Baldwin. Doesn't that feed something in her? Here is somebody who has been an actress and maybe wanted fame, but she's part of something, at least, with the target of her stalking and the person who she feels she shares 
a destiny with. So it's absolutely feeding into her that she is significant to him, he is significant to her, and actually they are connected in some way. Maurice Sakars was the attorney charged with representing Sabran in court. She was a beautiful, bright, engaging, articulate young lady. The more you spoke to her, and the more you spoke to her on the subject of uh, Mr. Baldwin, the more one might walk away from that conversation with the impression that her uh, feelings toward Mr. Baldwin were um, obsessive. But Sakars went forward with a strong defense for Sabaran's court case in May 2012. I have a client whose view of their relationship is that at one point he demonstrated affection for her. I understand that Mr. Baldwin denies that and you have a dispute of fact as to that. The important thing from my perspective when my client is being charged with a crime is whether or not she truly felt that the facts were as she perceived them to be and what her intentions were in light of that view of the facts. My client was charged with aggravated harassment, harassment, and stalking. And these crimes are crimes of intent. What was my client's true intention? And if you look closely at the content of these emails, one could say that Ms. Sabaran was enamored of Mr. Baldwin, even obsessed with Mr. Baldwin, but that her purpose was in determining whether or not he had any feeling for her. And it was on the basis of that point of view that I sought to defend my client, even if necessary, taking her case to trial. But it appeared Genevieve was taking no notice of the warnings given to her by the court. Manhattan prosecutors filed aggravated stalking charges against Genevieve because she continued during that period of time to continue to contact Alec Baldwin. He had a protective order against her, then, then, a, and then she was convicted and told, told to stay away, and she still came back to, to, to his, his apartment. She was charged with contempt of court because the court ordered her not to do something, and she disobeyed that particular order. And that's a much more problematic charge because it's somewhat straightforward. Judge says, you can't do X, Y, Z. If you do X, Y, Z, you violated the order. She feels that she's got this huge connection to Alec Baldwin. And that is the dilemma for a stalker. They can't stop thinking about that person. They are fixated. The word fixation literally comes from the Latin for bound together. They feel bound to that person and they feel bound to act in some way to maintain that connection. The resolution of the case that I was seeking to negotiate would have involved what we call an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal, where for a period of time she remains at liberty, demonstrates that her behavior and her intentions are such that she poses no danger to Mr. Baldwin and that at the end of a period of time, the district attorney's office would be prepared to dismiss the charges. But his efforts were in vain. Sabaran continued to break the protective order. I told her not to do that. The conditions of her bail required her not to do that. Quite clearly, she damaged my efforts to resolve the case without the need uh, of a trial and to do so without the need to have her plead guilty to any criminal charges. On the other hand, one could look at this set of facts and say that her continuing contact with Mr. Baldwin was the best evidence that she was obsessed. And one can look at it and argue that this type of behavior might better be treated with therapy than uh, with the blunt instrument of the criminal justice system. She felt that she needed to speak to him and sometimes those feelings can be overwhelming and some people can channel them into productive measures like jogging or yoga and she unfortunately chose a way uh, that was not productive and was unfortunately the grounds for her to be charged.
Her behavior made it impossible for her attorney to go any further with the case. It was time for Sakars to check out. Sabarine's lawyer actually files a motion to withdraw from representing her in court because she's not been listening to his advice and she absolutely will not abide by a protective order to keep away from Baldwin. This is not what she's interested in. She doesn't want a solution to this. She wants to be able to continue to be in contact with Alec Baldwin. And actually, if she agrees to what is being asked of her to stay away, then the story ends, the drama ends, and their relationship ends. On the day that the court heard my motion and granted my motion to be relieved, I left the courthouse. Miss Sabaran was standing next to me, turned to leave with me, and a police officer arrested her and put her in handcuffs. And she was charged with harassment directed toward the assistant district attorney who was prosecuting the case. I think she felt that somehow her actions were going to help her, whether it be going to talk to Mr. Baldwin in his house, whether it be going to social media to talk about the case, or whether it be reaching out to the New York County District Attorney's Office. She felt that if she could only do these things, everything would be resolved. Sabaran now needed a new attorney to take the case on. She appeared determined to get what she wanted, to take the case to trial. Ms. Sabarine contacted me to conduct the trial. She wanted me to be her trial counsel. Uh, I was committed to doing the trial. Obviously, I'm going to inform her of my opinion as to what the appropriate uh, next steps should be. There was a plea bargain on the table that I thought was advantageous to her. I did advise her to take it. She did not take it. She felt that trial was the appropriate action for her. And obviously, I'm going to support her position. And we went to trial. And it became very public and very ugly. The trial began on the 8th of November, 2013. I met her in court for several appearances before it actually went to trial. And she was always very eager to talk to the press, I always had a statement, and really wanted to fight the charges from the beginning. And I think she also really thrived on the attention. You know, every time she came to court, there were photographers here waiting for her, people to interview her. She was on TV, she was in the newspapers, and that was just going to be more, um, more intense during a trial. So the trial began November 8th, 2013, with opening statements. So both sides deliver their argument, and then the prosecution begins first. They call their witnesses, and they called Alec Baldwin to the stand and his wife later the following week. Inside the Manhattan courtroom, it was extremely tense. Alec Baldwin clearly wanted, you know, this woman to stop bothering him and his family. He now had small children at home. And Genevieve, though, was adamant that she was, you know, in her world, had this relationship with Alec Baldwin. He downplayed their interaction and said that it was purely business and that there was no romantic component. And um, she was very upset to hear that. She was very upset that he was not being honest and that um, he was lying under oath and lying to the court and trying to downplay his involvement. Baldwin gave a very theatrical performance, described the interaction with her as like a Hitchcock movie, he called it a nightmare. And at this point during his testimony, he started crying and sort of carefully wiped one tear from under his eye and said he was scared, scared that she might have a weapon and, and called the police when she came knocking at the door. Sabaran's refusal to sit quietly while Baldwin was on the stand intensified. During the trial, you saw that she was a little bit unstable and erratic and seemed to have some difficulty controlling herself in the courtroom. She was disruptive. I mean, she was getting up and screaming, and she couldn't believe that he would lie and embarrass her and say things that were not true. And there's an appropriate avenue to deal with that, which is cross-examination, and she couldn't wait. That must have fed something in her. She gets to be in a room with this great star who she's absolutely obsessed with, and she gets to shout at him while he gives his evidence. 
and say, no, we had a relationship, we had a relationship, you know, stop, stop lying about it, tell the truth. So it's almost as if she's creating this lover's tiff. She's creating a dynamic of a relationship within the courtroom, a relationship that doesn't exist. She called him a liar at one point, and then at another point she pointed to a scar and said, you have a scar, how would I know about the scar on your hip? And the judge kept telling her to stop interrupting the proceedings. He warned her repeatedly. This is actually pretty unusual for a defendant that frequently to interrupt the proceedings with interjections. Hilaria, Alec Baldwin's wife, took the stand to testify about how when Genevieve was arrested, that she was ca calling her names, saying, bitch, bitch, bitch. And, you know, when she was on the stand testifying about it, Genevieve broke out in court and said, you're lying, you're gonna go to hell. Sabarain is shouting all of the time. She's screaming at Baldwin while he gives his evidence. She's screaming at Baldwin's fiance and mother of his child. And it really just descends into something almost farcical. She was very vociferous in saying, no, this is not fair. I am the one who you should feel sympathy for because I've been misused by this man. I've been sexually misused by him and I've been rejected by him. And in actual fact, if that had happened and Alec Baldwin says that didn't happen, it doesn't justify her behavior. When it was Genevieve's turn to take the stand, she stood her ground on her version of the events. She took the stand in her defense and she testified about their evening, about how they met, about what happened that night and what happened after the fact, and about the underlying reasons for her contact with him. She was adamant and that she had done nothing wrong and that this shouldn't qualify as stalking, that they were, you know, were in this relationship and had these, you know, this history together. So um, the prosecutors were going, you know, were prosecuting her and she ended up breaking down and crying on the stand, describing her romantic relationship with him. Judge Mandelbaum's patience was already wearing thin. He was very annoyed that she couldn't control herself she kept interrupting. He told her over and over again to stop speaking out in the middle of the court, to respect the process, and she seemed genuinely unable to do so. After a short deliberation, the judge passed sentence. She was found guilty, and the judge sentenced her to 180 days in jail, and also she was given an extra 30 days of contempt for her behavior on the stand. Was she surprised? I think she was surprised. Yeah, it, you know, it, it took a toll on her. It was a significant sentence for a misdemeanor crime. Uh, six months in the city jail as a foreigner uh, who's not even from New York, it's a lot to deal with. Genevieve began her sentence at Rikers Island Prison. Rikers Island is a notorious prison in New York City, and that is where Genevieve was sent. It is where some of the biggest criminals go and it is not a place that has very nice accommodations. You know, the paint is peeling off the walls, there's cockroaches roaming around, there's no air conditioning, there's no heat, so the summers are excruciating and the winters are freezing. It is not great conditions. Rikers Island or not, nothing, it appeared, was going to change Genevieve's story. It's interesting that after this court case, which was heavily reported on in the media, I must have been a source of humiliation for Sabarin, not to mention the fact that she ended up with six months in jail as a result. And yet she continues to post YouTube messages and YouTube videos about Alec Baldwin. Alec was calling me and Alec was texting me. Strange. <laughs> anyway, let you know that I went for dinner with Al Pacino. I really did. Like, is it like a crazy joke? And I'm gonna tell you everything about it. So I answer the question, the why do I talk about it still? And some people in my comment, thank you for you, said she still talks about it because she's innocent and she needs to find a way to clear her name. And only a true innocence would spend six and a half years bringing this subject to life again and again. Why? Because for me, it's still reactualized every day. I really want to uh, not become rich and famous, 
But if I do, fine. You know, I'm never gonna say no to this. But it's not my uh, my prime objective. My prime objective is really to use uh, how difficult my situation was and how bully I was and how um, disrespect I've been. I've. I've been living uh, since six and a half years and all the consequences of my injustice and help other people that are suffering. Nearly a decade later, there are no winners in this case of obsessive stalking. This was a great story. It had everything. You have an A-list actor, you have a beautiful stalker, um, and you have a lot of lies. There are two sides to every story, but in this case, Jean Viev is in the wrong. Yes, they might have had a relationship, but I think she just became obsessed with Alec. She became obsessed with being with him, with wanting what he has, with wanting to be with him, with wanting to start a family with him, and that just wasn't possible. And she just became obsessed and absorbed with everything that had to do with him. Unfortunately, I think that this is what has defined her, defined her career. You know, this is the what, it, what she's become most known for, is having been convicted of stalking a famous actor rather than her own acting career. She had the opportunity to walk away early on without a criminal record. Forget going to jail, without a criminal record. And she made a very educated and informed decision not to do that. Someone who makes those types of decisions is not someone who later on comes back and says, you know what, I regret it. So I don't think she regrets it at all. If you type in Genevieve Sabarin to Google, then very likely Alec Baldwin's name is also going to pop up. So she is connected to him. She is permanently connected to him on the internet and in newspaper articles and in a program like this. So it's interesting how a stalker can manipulate and create a situation where they do become significant in another person's life, even if it's in a negative way. I have been extremely damaged and hurt, and I will survive, I will thrive, and I will win it. <laughs> so big kiss, everybody. I love you, and speak to you soon on another video.